Hey, welcome to the For Evansville podcast, a podcast about learning the needs and dreams of our city uh, so that we can not just be in Evansville, but before Evansville. Um, we've enjoyed listening to a lot of stories of how different people are um, helping our city flourish and helping make our city a place where every person flourishes. And uh, today we have another story like that, and we're excited to have a guest with us uh, here at the office. Adrian, yep. why don't you uh, make an introduction for us? Sure. Well, we have Katrinka here with the Evansville Rescue Mission, and I'll let her explain all of her title and everything she does. I feel like she wear a person who wears a lot of hats, uh, not just for the rescue mission, but for our city as well. So we're excited to have you here. Thank you so much for just hanging out with us today. Um, why don't you go ahead and just tell us why you're here? I'm super excited. This is my first podcast ever. So I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, welcome. And to be one for Evansville. <laughs> yeah. I mean, does it get any better? But thank you for inviting me. I am with the Evansville Rescue Mission. And actually, I'm the Capital Campaign Manager for the Susan H. Snyder Center for Women and Children. So that is what I'm currently doing is helping us fill Tracy Gorman's dream. Right. So the Evansville Rescue Mission is usually associated with uh, homeless men and homeless right. men's shelter. So tell us about the women's shelter. So, yeah. You know, I don't know if you realize when you look at statistics that, like today, I believe there was 120 gentlemen at the mission is where we're at today. Okay. The mission will serve 50,000 meals a month. I mean, you've had Philip here. You realize what all we got going on there. Well, that's great. Uh, any any given day in Evansville, you've got 500 homeless. I just did a count a few months ago to the best of the ability. 300 are men, and we're averaging about 200 women a day mm. wow. to women and children that are homeless. Well, that's mm. horrible, first off. And second off, there's only roughly 70 long-term beds in Evansville that is not mm. meant for a, you know an, intake, an intact family or for um, domestic violence. So then you got roughly 150 women at night with their kids on the street or couch surfing or hotel room surfing, whatever they can do to get that. Mm -hmm. We want to fix that. Yeah, We are opening the, uh, the Susan H. Snyder Center for Women and Children, and it will be over off of Professional Boulevard. And we're going to be able to have rooms for 125 women and children. That's How awesome. amazing is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's So huge. excited. And yeah. this isn't just rooms like a place for people to stay, um, which we we did have Philip on uh, a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. and that's a great episode. He he talks a little bit about um, how Rescue Mission has a lot of other um, programming, really taking a holistic approach to what are all of the different challenges. So could you speak to that a little bit Absolutely. too, that um, there are specific, unique challenges that women who are experiencing homelessness are often facing, what will be some of the resources available to help them? So kind of like with the men's shelter, to kind of spin off that, is you know we have the programming there, which a lot of people don't realize, and I'm so glad Philip talked about that, is that mm -hmm. we're based as a rescue. You have 15 days, and then you move into programming. Programming is when you are ready to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Well, we will be set up the same way at the Center for Women and Children. We will have, you'll have a few, you know, your 15 days rescue. And then at that point, if you're like, yes, I am ready for that hand up. I am ready to get me and my children healthy, safety, every, mm -hmm. every adjective yeah. you can think of. Mm -hmm. So that will be the exact same way. They will get their stay. And then upon that, whereas at the men's shelter, we, we have dormitories and we have different levels of apartments or dormitories, however you want to call them. It'll be the same way next door at the Women's Center. We'll have large dorm rooms, and then we'll have rooms for families. We'll have rooms that are bigger for, I think you saw one the other day, which is a room set up for a bigger family, a mom that might have three or four kids. Yeah. But it's a place that these kids are going to get a, a, a pillow, a blanket, a mattress. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the mommies are, can go to sleep and not worry wh who's going to knock on the door, who's going to come in the door, what might be crawling around on the floor. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just things that we all don't want to think about. Yeah. You've got moms all over this town. And not just the moms. I mean, you've got single women. 
But I think about the moms because I am a mom and a grandma, and I tend to really relate to the child-grandchild aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I think about these women that are doing whatever they can and do to pay for a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And when I say can and will, it's just if we don't want to discuss. Mm -hmm. But to them, they're protecting their kids. Yeah, they're they're protecting themselves. Yeah. They're, they've got a roof over their head, and there's food in their belly. It doesn't matter to them what it took to get that. Yeah, but it matters to us. Yeah, right. Let us come here to help you. Yeah, you you mentioned whenever Adrian had a chance to come see the building, Adrian. Yes. I haven't actually got to hear from you about yeah. that experience. So could you just <laughs> kind of share, like, live where, yeah, were there? <laughs> was there anything? There you go. I'm was there sure. anything? Yeah. Yeah, was there anything that like surprised you or stood out to you as you had a chance to tour yes. the the space? So many things. First of all, the the building is so well maintained yes. and kept, uh, which is great. It's a great starting point for where you already are. Um, from the outside, I would say it it looks like a, it was a professional building, yeah. and it, and it looks like it. But when I came in, I wasn't expecting the warmth that it already has. Like the carpets are still clean. The walls yeah. are still white. Um, there, it was a big open air, like two story with a balcony looking over it. And I just thought, what a, what a welcoming place already, Aww. even without the renovations. That makes me feel so good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then when, um, on my tour, it was just so many rooms and I feel like it's been, everything has been thought through and just the holistic care that you're providing. There is like, this is you. When I was walking through, it was like this is where the clinic is going to be yep. to provide health care. This is where the daycare is going to be. This is where the dining hall is going to be, and even like a little space for kids to play in the dining hall because everyone that's a mom knows like how frantic it is <laughs> to have children <laughs> while you're trying to eat. But they've yeah. they've even thought through that, and so it was just a really cool um, experience just to see. So how yeah, just how every everybody's thinking through everything in that holistic care. They are. Yeah. I will give Tracy Corman so much credit for that. Everything that goes through his mind and the way he thinks about things and he processes them and how it's gonna affect people that it's involved, mm -hmm. down to just being a member of his team. I mean, that man is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And then you walk into our buildings and you just feel the spirit. And so I feel like you when you walk into what we mm -hmm. short term at the six the 1400 building because the address yeah mm -hmm. it, you can just feel like you said you feel the warmth and that's our goal the health clinic will be able for both our the males the male mission and for the women mm -hmm. um, so that way we I've talked to both hospitals they want a partner to help give them the health care they need the will be like you said the child care center yeah. well how awesome is that you could be able to take your kid to daycare every day. And we both know what daycare is like, you know, there is finding good any. daycare. <laughs> yeah. And then sh mommy can then go to Ivy Tech and go to college or USI. She can go get a job and she can start filling those needs and start building herself up because she's going to need that mental, physical, spiritual, every wellness you can think of. She's going to need that. And we're going to help provide that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we are not giving her a handout. At mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. giving her a hand up, yeah, yeah. and well, hopefully we can break some of the cycle. Yeah, well, and one of the things yeah. that I loved whenever we were talking about this offline was um, as you talked about some of the community partnerships that oh. you guys are cultivating. Um, you, it seems like Rescue Mission recognizes, hey, uh, we want to provide kind of a missing piece um, in the path towards you know that hand up. Um, by creating this shelter and this space, um, but recognizing you don't have to reinvent a bunch of the other pieces because they already exist in our community. So just bringing those into partnership and um, making this a place where it's easy for these women and families to get connected to those different resources. Could you speak to kind of uh, if you were to just dream really big about what kinds of opportunities would be available, and I know some of them you guys have already worked to secure, but um, walk us through like what the ideal experience would be for a woman coming into the shelter and saying, hey, I'm ready to um, – 
take steps toward, you know, kind of a better life for me and my kids, Mm -hmm. what would you love to see as some of those partnerships within our community? You mean like, like, like businesses that want to partner with and how they can help? Yeah, but life? just just in general. I mean, just you mentioned in, Ivy Tech as one. Yeah, just any um, partnership like that. Any any different employer or any different school that can we can work with mm-hmm. to help them um, being a part of Junior League. I've talked with a couple of the girls that want to come together and make a clothes closet, but it's a mm-hmm. professional closet so that mm-hmm. if they do have yeah. an interview, we can make sure she has the right clothing to wear um, based on my career path in the past and the few other connections I have to make sure that they're with some different organizations, their resume is ready, some mm. job skills. Let's go through interviewing skills because those aren't skills that maybe she had or felt confident to have. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll have a beauty shop in there. So partnering with local stylists to help come in and, you know, give you that extra feel good, that simple thing of getting your hair styled. I mean, yeah. the guys yeah. get it and I understand, but come on, we're women. Come on. Yeah. We know it's like when we get to go to the beauty shop, okay? <laughs> right. So to get some of those partnerships, working with other organizations to maybe partner with to have a closet to help us with supply the formula or maybe a mm-hmm. diaper closet. A church is like, hey, we want to do your diaper closet. That would be yeah. a great partnership oh, for yeah. us, as well as just a general clothes closet. We've had some PM physician's assistants and some other doctors have reached out. We, they want to volunteer their time. So mm. that amazes cool. me is how the community is truly seen. This is a strong need. This is yeah. a huge need right now. Mm. So yeah. when I was there, I feel like a couple people brought up that. Um, I'm surprised to hear you say like the community is seeing it as a huge need because yeah. the other side of that was we don't see women on the streets. You uh, sound you know. like me my first week of work. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, You're like, thanks for the job, but w- what? <laughs> do we really need this? What yeah. Is <laughs> and that's I don't see what it. I said. <laughs> well, that's what I think um, maybe the general community that just sees the homeless population on the streets, on the corners, they're not women. So... But it, in your statistics, there are just as many women and children as there are so, men. So where are they? And what's kind of their situation like that now? That was legit. My first week of work, I was like, okay, I see the men everywhere. Yeah. Now, talk to me. And I will say, Kyle looked at me and said, your view is going to change. Your eyes are going to change, give mm-hmm. it a month. Yeah. And he's right. I mm-hmm. now see things I would have never saw before. Yeah. And things that I would pass in the street, and it would just would just go past it. And now mm. I'm catching on. Oh, mm. I know what that is now. My first couple of weeks, it was in December, freezing cold outside, and went out with another organization, and we went with one of the girls from work, and I went together, and we we said we want to see, take us. Mm-hmm. So we ended off up behind Fairs Avenue on the railroad tracks, ended up down on Pigeon Creek. And we ended up seeing some tent villages. It was mm. heartbreaking. I saw a woman who just say, I will never forget the look of how her fingers looked. And they looked how your fingers look when you age and you get arthritis and they start turning in. Mm. This girl couldn't have been, had to be early 20s. And it was from being cold. Walking over that railroad track, I looked down on one of the pillars and I saw an elf on the shelf, a blanket, a little pocket of toddler blanket. Mm. I got we swaddle a baby in. Yeah. Yeah. And a coloring book broke my heart to realize Mm. this could be a child's. So I went back and said, okay, I get it. But I still don't get it. Mm -hmm. If you're by our our office, our building on Walnut Street, anywhere at lunch or in the mornings especially, you're going to see the number of women because obviously we serve three meals a day. Mm -hmm. Anybody's welcome. Mm. Go on even Ferris Avenue at 7 o'clock in the morning, school bus, and see how many school buses come through there and pick up kids. As a mom, you're going to do everything you can to protect your children. And you're not, you don't want anyone to see you because what if that would put you on the radar of maybe Department of Children and Family Services? Mm. You're going to do yeah. everything you can to protect those kids. Yeah. So there's women that are doing things that we don't want to discuss to have a roof over the head at night. Mm-hmm. To them, they didn't. They're not homeless because they paid for a hotel room, 
or they're in a situation where they're being abused and being a horrific lifestyle. But again, their brain is so traumatized. They've got a roof and their kids have food in their mm-hmm. belly. Yeah. Got to keep those factors in mind because as a mom, that fight or flight kicks in. Mm-hmm. As a single woman, yeah. you're you're finding a trap house somewhere in Evansville. Maybe you're couch surfing from friend to friend to friend. They find places to be, but they're not long-term help you get off your feet situations. Yeah. Well, and I think even our uh, general perception of what we think of whenever we say the word homeless um, can be pretty limited to yes. somebody who's sleeping on the street, not realizing that homelessness is actually much broader than that, that it covers, yeah. that term covers a much broader range of experiences. You mentioned things like couch surfing and, you know, some people sleeping in their car or things yeah. like that. They they may have a place to be, um, but it's not a, uh, it's not a long-term or even, you know, um, fit short-term uh, home where you can uh, have a place to be that allows you to function and make progress and do the kinds of things that you need to do. When we were out that morning, we went on some different parking lots here in town. And there was cars that I would have never noticed, you know, three weeks before that. And now I see them constantly and I'm like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And you realize there's people living in their cars. And we knocked on the windows of some of those cars and offered them resources, help. And every time they're like, nope, we're fine. We're not homeless. We don't need anything. Mm. Because that's, they've got somewhere to be. Mm-hmm. The other day we had, um, we were hosting our board meeting at the new building just so the board could see it, see some of the things we've done, look at some of the floor plans. And as one of the board members was pulling up, a lady walked up and mm. she saw the sign and said, I get chills, and said, are you open? And this board member said, no, ma'am, I'm sorry, we're not, not yet. Oh, well, I've been everywhere in town, and there's nowhere to go. Mm. So we don't see the women, but the women are there. Yeah. And I hate that she showed up at our door already, mm-hmm. and we weren't ready for her. Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm like, they know we're coming. Mm-hmm. And I know we're going to be able to fulfill, we're going to be able to change the lives of some people. And it's not us changing them. It's us offering the tools for you to be able to change your own life, mm-hmm. which to me is I watch some of those guys at the mission, and I just want to, I mean, I could just hug up on all of them because you just watch the changes they make and see where they're going and their goals and watch them obtain them. Yeah, there are guys at back that have issues, and maybe just when you think they've made it, we do. Things happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But— you always hope that the next day that they realize it, they get up, they come back, and we make that change again. Mm. And I hope that for the women, too. Yeah. I just want to see the kids thrive. Yeah, that's huge. And not take them all home. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, as you, were, as you were describing just kind of some of the living situations of people who are experiencing homelessness, <clears throat> women and children, and um what that can be like. One of the things that came to mind is uh, I think one of the really powerful things about Rescue Mission and about the new um, Center for Women and Families um, is it's not just a place to stay, but it's a place to belong. And I think think something that um, maybe our community as a whole could be better at is uh, helping people who are experiencing homelessness to still feel like they belong yes. in our community. Um, certainly having resources like Rescue Mission and some of our other shelters and this new um, space that's opening up are ways for us to collectively say that, to say even if that's a challenge that you're facing, you're still part of our community and we want you to have a place to go and a place to be cared for. Um, but I think in general, there's sort of this, um, social awkwardness that comes with, uh, interacting with somebody who is experiencing homelessness for, for most people. I think people feel a a certain sense of discomfort. And I'm curious as you've 
stepped into this role and kind of been exposed more to that world. I wonder if you've learned anything personally or if you would have advice for people um, around how to just help people that you might encounter who are experiencing homelessness to feel like they belong and to feel like they're seen and like they're a valued piece of our community, even if they're facing a really difficult situation right now. Oh, you're making me cry. <laughs> it, it is. That was, um, and I came from that mindset. I remember pulling up at corners and, you know, you would, you would have fears or you would have, you'd wonder, or then you'd wonder what happened, you know, where did this person come from? And so many people, your first thought is addictions. Okay, well, addiction is a problem, but what's the trauma that brought you to that addiction? Yeah. So learning to open your eyes like I did, you know, we're taught you're to view people a certain way. Don't throw that first stone. You don't know what, what went on in their life. Mm -hmm. So learn to open your eyes and to see the individuals and know that's a human being also. You don't know what they're going through or what happened. I'm not saying you've got to roll your window down every time and hand money. I, I, I don't know that, but I know that the guys, they're taking their time, who've knocked on our door at the mission and said, I'm here, I'm ready. They need that hug. They need that smile. They need that, hey, I truly know you're struggling, and I'm praying for you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to just lend you that prayer and be there for you. If, you know, you get a hold of us and maybe you're having some guys volunteer, Maybe have an extra special thing for them that day. Maybe the other day for the event you were at, mm -hmm. the guys came and helped me set up. So I stopped at Parlor Donuts. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's just things like that. Just just because people are homeless or they're addicts or they have a temper. I mean, we can go so many adjectives. We're still humans. Mm -hmm. And we still need to take the time to stop and see each person as a whole person. And don't judge them by the adder because you really don't know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I feel like it really changed my view on things. It made me stop and really look at people as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's something I don't think we always do in society. We judge so many books, and that's not the way to do it. Don't judge that cover. Mm -hmm. Take the time to get to know that person and know where they're at and what they're coming from. And maybe all they simply need is you to simply talk to them. Yeah, I've and you know we were at um, Patchwork one morning, and just sat and just talked. I was at Bread and Peace one day and just talked to the residents. Just learned about them and their story mm -hmm. and where they came from and why. Yeah, knowing everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a story you wouldn't have picked up, a book you wouldn't have read, but it's still a good book, and the ending's not done yet. Mm. Yeah, the hallmark's gonna call me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's oh really God. good. Yeah, right then. Yeah. Well, I uh, does that yeah. kind of answer your question? I mean, I, I think kind of, so. Yeah. yeah. I I like how um, you said that they're seeing them as a whole person. Uh, I think that is something we've missed the mark on, maybe even as a society. Amen. Um, that solving homelessness just means they need a house or they need more money <laughs> in their pocket or they just they just need to get a job so that they can get money um you know to get a house that kind of thing but what can you speak to why it's important to focus holistically on a on a person and not just these one individual things why doesn't money just solve somebody's problem well, don't we wish money would solve all problems? <laughs> I mean, wow, my life would be amazing. What? Oh, no, my, my life's amazing now, though. Let me rephrase that. I have an amazing life. <laughs> you know, people think that. So often you see that, well, they're only homeless because they couldn't budget their money or they this or that. There is no one set answer why someone is homeless. We don't know what went on in their life. Did they lose their job? We saw so much in the, in the economy the past few years. But did something happen there? Was it because of that? Did that then cause an addiction, which then caused it to spiral? So I think holistically, we have to heal from the inside out. 
you have to find that that mental health because there's obviously a trauma. If you are homeless, you are going through a trauma. Mm-hmm. So let's heal that trauma. Let's help you get the job skill maybe you need. Maybe you didn't have one before or it wasn't a great one. Okay, you have a great job skill. You were a CEO of some company and you got the all that to back you up. But something happened that led you to addiction. So it's finding out the whole thing. You can solve someone's addiction. And the only way to solve an addiction, if you talk to anyone who has an addiction, it's the whole package. You've got to fix the mental side, the spiritual side, the physical health. Mm-hmm. So there's no, mm-hmm. you just can't throw money at something. <clears throat> You've right. got to throw everything at something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They have to. And that's why our program is so important that they go through their classes and those they go through a chapel. All those things are important. And a lot of times, a lot of them being, ex- being exposed to things they never were exposed to before. Mm-hmm. I sat through one of my first AA meetings one day and it was it was awesome because one of them, one of the individuals the mission that works the mission that I adore got his seven year chip. Wow. I never sat in an AA meeting. But to sit there and listen, it made you look at things different. Mm-hmm. It made you say, you know, the guy, you know, this week, just pray for me to get through this week. I, I'm struggling with this. It wasn't always their struggle with their addiction. It was with a mental issue or a trauma. Yeah. I'm like, that's that just showed me you've got to do it as a whole. I mean, you can't tell me we all three sitting here have never dealt with a trauma, right. never dealt with something. We all have. Mm-hmm. We just, for whatever sake, we're able to. Push through and land up on our feet. Mm-hmm. We well, could a lot of times, of those. a lot of times, that's because we have uh, the support system you around the words us. Out of my mouth, right? Mm-hmm. You yep. know, we have something um, potentially catastrophic happen yeah. in our lives, um, and we have people around us who uh, can provide that support yeah, system. Exactly. And I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the degree to which. We as a community can be better at embracing people who don't have that support system and making room, you know, within our own communities and friend groups and families for um, people who don't have those relationships. Uh, I think that's such a a crucial piece of it. But I think we have to approach those relationships recognizing that as much as we might have something to offer people who are experiencing that, um, that they also have something valuable to contribute to their relationship and to our community. And I think that's what we miss out on oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes that awkwardness that we feel comes from a sense of uh, we see somebody only for their need. And it's a need that we might not be able to meet. And uh, that is a little disorienting to us. I don't I don't know how to interact with this person because I don't have what they need. Um, instead of recognizing uh, I'm coming into that relationship or that conversation with needs as well, and that um, if we can see people as people and also recognize uh, that they have something of value to offer us as well, then... It levels the it levels the relational ground a you know little bit more. The best thing you have to offer, yeah, is the smile. When you see someone and they are, whether they are in a restaurant, or they stepped into maybe inside a building somewhere, or they come into your church, instead of shunning, a smile mm-hmm. or a hello. Mm-hmm. What did that cost you? Yep, and that could have made that person's day instead of looking at them with a disgruntled look just simple a smile and hey have a great day or hi you don't have to give them anything you don't have to sit beside them but you offered just that small token Mm -hmm. they've been they've been pushed down and I had someone quote this the other day to me I was talking about some gentleman that had helped me with some muffins and cookies that another event and I wanted to show them my thanks and I was talking to somebody's like you know you got to realize these guys have been kicked down so many times Mm -hmm. and the women are the same way and sometimes it's just that simple hey thanks hey I truly appreciated what you did or hey have a great day 
I grabbed your dad, ran in, and I said they were eating. And I asked my guy, I said, hey, can you just, because the food line was still open, those green beans look good. Will you put them in a coffee cup for me? And he's like, really? You, you don't want a full meal? I'm like, no, I just want green beans. And he gave me the strangest look and goes, okay. And I was like, you know, I really appreciate you do this. Thank you. Have a great day. You know, I get made fun of so often because I'm one of those that's always going to say, hey, have a great day. Hey, good morning. Hey, how's your day going? But think about it. Think if you walk in the office and you're having a bad day and you simply walk in and say, hey, guys, isn't it beautiful outside? Changes your mood, doesn't it? Now be someone who's going through everything they're going through. Yeah. And you simply show kindness, compassion, gratitude. Aren't we taught that? Is that not in the Bible? <laughs> yeah. Are we not taught to do that? That's all it takes. Yeah. I was reading a, a study where they interviewed uh, people that were living in poverty all over the world, and they just kind of took clips. Um, and the common thread of their definition of poverty <laughs> wasn't— money or items or things, the common thread between all of them was some form of a broken relationship. I don't feel seen. I have no voice. It, it was it was all relational. And I think that there's something it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And it was something huge for me to just rethink that the the poverty is really the poverty of our spirit first. Yes. And um those broken relationships are what needs to be healed first. That's amazing. Um, and addressed. Yeah. And that goes back to the traumas. Think about, you know, when you've got the trauma, you talk exactly what you're talking about. Oh, oh that was good. Look at you. Mm -hmm. Look at you teaching me today. <laughs> it is from a wow. book I was reading. So, yeah. Well, wow. and I think, that's, I think that's partially one of the things that I've uh, learned from um, just friendship with people who are experiencing poverty and experiencing homelessness is yeah. – um, they're in a position that requires them to depend on other people more than I'm forced to do that. Oh. And uh, so it's a lot easier for somebody in my situation to um, to just be try, to try to be self-sufficient and to take care of myself and to not depend on other people and cultivate close relationships as much. Um, but I've learned from, several people that I've known who uh, are experiencing poverty or homelessness that, um, first of all, they tend to be uh, very generous towards each other and help each other out and share what they do have. Yes, um, do. And also uh, just really seem to understand the importance of relationships. And, and maybe that comes from needing to depend on one another. And maybe it comes from recognizing um, you know, the, the brokenness of relationships that has maybe been part of their life in the past. But, um, I think that's one of those areas that, uh, we have a lot that we can learn, uh, from people who are experiencing those types of hardships Absolutely. is, mm -hmm. um, is that type of generosity and relationship and recognizing that it really is about, uh, people and, but yeah, I just think that can be. You're right. I look forward to that at the center. Mm -hmm. Once the women are there, is watching them with those relationships, mm -hmm. watching as each of them heal mm -hmm. and seeing how they give and how they end up giving back to the community and how they end up giving back to themselves and to the women around them and the community within the center. Mm -hmm. You know, the men work, the men really do build each other up. Yeah. And I look forward to watching the women do the same and seeing that. I just look forward to watching this all come to pass. I'm looking forward to the first resident. Yeah. And, I mean, but you're right on so many levels is that I read a book um, under the overpass, and it was two gentlemen that spent the year homeless. I mean, they, they did it as a study. Hmm. So let's preface with that. Yeah. But reading the book was, for me as a new in the position, was life-changing because mm -hmm. it made me look at our residents different. Mm. Because this book talked about what each one of them going through and talked about so often how there would be, for lack of better words, a cookout because someone was able to get a hold of this food. Yeah. So they'd go to this part of the park and invite everybody. Yeah. And like you said, they got where they would help their communities they had built up yeah. mm -hmm. take care of each other, know where each other is at, watch out for each other, protect each other. 
And I think it's really cool. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? Yeah. yeah that's very cool. Um, could, as we wrap up, could you just give us some details on, like, what's the timeline look like for this project? How can people get involved? You mentioned a yeah. lot of uh, kind of different ways that people could partner. So ways. And so if somebody was listening to that and they said, oh, that sounds like something we could do, or maybe they have another idea that's, that they would say, Absolutely. hey, what if we did this? Uh, who could they reach out to about that? Yeah. Give, give us some of those details. So I would say if you have any ideas, suggestions, um, you have a want to give on your heart, reach out to the Evansville Rescue Mission and ask for myself, Katrinka Reinder. If you want to send a donation, still make attention to me. That way I can make sure it goes to the Center for Women and Children. We're still looking for partners. The timeline is, um, originally we thought the first resident would not be till 25 because we just didn't know. Mm. But like we mentioned that the architects have been in the building. They said the building has, as Tracy Gorman will put, good bones. <laughs> which is a lot of HGTV. Isn't there a song about that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a I country so. song. I think there, there is a country <laughs> song about it. I'll play that for him now. But we, um, that it's not going to be as hard, like you saw, it's not going to be near what we thought yeah. to rehab the building. So now they're, they've pushed our timeline up to hopefully late summer, early fall next year. Wow. Oh so yeah, it gives me chills so if I say exciting. that. It's so exciting. Um, we will run the campaign and through through um, the year 27, and that is simply because we don't want to take money from the annual giving at the mission and everything else we have already going on with the thrift store and the coffee shop and YCC and Camp Reveal. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we want to keep the Center for Women and Children separate up to that point, and then we will fall over everything. And that's something that, like I was telling you all, I'm so proud of the fact, 106 years People truly think the mission takes government money, and we do not. Mm-hmm. We couldn't stand on our spiritual and our Christian feet if that we did because it's the government. So how amazing is that we don't have to? Mm-hmm. So we have through then to just get everything set, done. Hopefully the we have hired our new executive director for the um, mission yeah. so that she's going to be able to start working with Nate at the min- the mission to start learning um how we do things, why we do it, the programming, writing the policy and procedures. Yeah. I mean, she's got a lot of work to do before we get our first resident. Yeah. But it's just, that's what we've got going on. I mean, we've looked at different partnerships. If a church wants to run my diaper closet, I've talked to an organization here in town about the formula closet. It could be helping out with the medical clinic. Maybe you, your organization's like, hey, we want to help out with the children's center. Can we maybe provide toys? Mm-hmm. Or we'll we want to buy three tables. It's going to go into your um, your dining hall. I mean, it's just simple things like that. Yeah. We're to that point. If you like, hey, we want to find a room. Can we do a dorm room? <laughs> Absolutely, call me up. Sure. Yeah. And our conversation we've discussed is that if your organization wants to have a room named after you, a dorm room, then you will stay within our color guidelines. We'll let you decorate it. Hmm. To kind of put oh, your cool. spin on it, but stay within our. <laughs> right. <laughs> we yeah. still got a little bit, of, <laughs> little bit of control there, but just different things like that. There's so many opportunities. I had a woman the other day call me, and she had a bunch of children's coats. Well, when we do our gobbler gathering in in November, Thanksgiving, we always do a coat drive. Yeah. So she called me up and gave me a dozen kids' coats, and then a donation to the women and children. That way, we could help just anything. So at this point, I had an organization ask me the other day, what can I do? And I wasn't expecting them to give me the ask for money. So I was like, well, here it is. To me, anywhere from a dollar to $1 million is what God had placed on your heart to give. And you're going to give and do what you can do. So if it's just a dollar, bring me a dollar. Because 20 people is $20, and that just adds up. If it's 10000 100000 if it's a million— you gave what you needed to give and know that that money will be used in ways you never understood because I've already seen it and I know it's going to happen and I know it's going to be amazing. And I'm just so honored to be a part of it, to be working for it. And I just wish I could have met Susan before she passed because mm-hmm. everything I've heard is she was an amazing individual. Mm-hmm. So I just look forward to that. Yeah. And all we can do is, Please continue to pray for us because that's what we need. 
because yeah. we all know what's going to happen as we keep further in this. The devil's going to do everything he can to stop it because this train is rolling. <laughs> so we just need the prayers to keep that train going. All right. Well, all of this information will be in our show notes. Uh, so you can find links there. Uh, after. Yeah. <laughs> and and you can also connect with us at connect at foreevansville.org if you just want to send us an email. You can sign up for our email list where we'll include kind of a little bit further, deeper into these topics uh, through an email that you can receive when a new episode drops. So make sure you sign up for that as well at our website. But thank you again thank so you much guys. for being yeah, here. Thanks so We're much, so Christian. glad that you're here. Adventure. Yeah. <laughs> How's your first podcast experience? Was it? I don't know. We'll see if the reviews come back. Oh, at some point, we're going to have to dig into the fact that you said that you eat green beans out of a coffee cup, but well, we don't I, have time uh, yeah, for that in this right. episode. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening, and um, thank you, Katrinka, for thank you, being with us today. I appreciate it so much. Hey, co-host Adrian here, and out of all the thousands of available podcasts, you're listening to this one because you love Evansville. Well, we obviously love Evansville too, but we can't tell these stories without the support of people like you. We want to give you the opportunity to partner with our storytelling work here at For Evansville. Your donation will allow us to continue to share these unique stories about how people are working together to make Evansville a place where everyone can flourish. And the cool news is right now we have a $50,000 match, so any gift you give will be doubled. So help us complete the match by going to foreevansville.org slash podcast partner, or you can find the link in the show notes. Thanks for being for Evansville.